Hey everybody, I'm Bart Massey as always, and today I want to have a little chat with you about async await in Rust, because that's a thing that's very exciting these days, and a lot of people are paying attention to it, and so we probably should be paying attention to it too. In this video, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what I understand so far about what's actually a fairly complicated topic, and hopefully by the end we will both understand it a little bit better. Uh, one of my favorite sort of scenes from The Simpsons is the one where they ask Lionel Hutz if he's actually an attorney. He says, mm, well, no, but I did see an episode of Matlock in the bar last night. The sound was off, but I think I got the gist of it. I kind of feel like that might be where I am with Async Await at this point, but I have got some things written and working, so, you know, even if it's not my usual level of comfort, I think there's things to be, fig to be figured out here. So let's dive into this and talk about it a little bit. So... To understand the motivation for async await, we've got to go back a long ways. The early computers were all single, were not concurrent or parallel in any way. Uh, whoever was running the computer right then had the computer. And of course, in that environment, since computers were crazily expensive, you shared the computer by doing what was called batch processing. You'd give away, um, you know, you'd run a job through the computer and then somebody else would come and run a job through the computer and when computers got big enough and fast enough folks noticed that it might be a good idea to sort of instead of sharing at the level of whole batches uh, have sort of several batches running interleaved you could simulate sort of several virtual computers running each running their own batch and nobody would know the difference that's time sharing and it was a huge success uh the fundamental unit of time sharing is the process is a uh, chunk of work that appears to have its own memory space own the cpu itself talk to the operating system itself and processes are fantastic they provide concurrency and if you have multiple processors like we do so often these days they provide parallelism you can run one process on one core and another process on another core and everybody's very happy so what's the problem then with processes well i mean they're great they isolate the control flow and data from each other. Uh, anything I do isn't going to affect your data, isn't going to affect your control flow in your process. The semantics are really easy. The OSs have been tuned for 50 years to deal well with them, and so they're great, but there's some sort of inherent inefficiencies in the process situation. First of all, inter-process communication is inefficient. If I want to send some data to another process, I have to arrange that with the operating system and copy my data in typically into the operating system's memory space. The operating system then has to copy it into the process's memory space. Those copies might be virtual, they might be real, but they're almost surely expensive however they're done. And so that's not so good. Uh, the worst thing too is that um, the extra communication problem is that to switch from one process to another is an expensive operation. It's what's called a context switch and typically involves saving a lot of state, restoring a lot of state, and can take a very long time. Um, the memory usage isn't great either. Now I've got three copies of things floating around, caches get blown out, the whole thing is kind of not so pleasant. So. Somebody had the bright idea, I don't know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, to instead of having processes not share memory, maybe we should have things that are like processes but do share memory. Maybe we should have threads. And a thread is, from the operating system's point of view, a process light. It has its own registers. It has its own stack. It does have some of its own local memory maybe, but mostly its memory space is shared with um, other threads running in the same process. And so that's fantastic. Um, they 
it isolates the control flow still. Anything I do with my control flow shouldn't affect the control flow of other threads. Um, it's reasonably understandable to program with them. POSIX thread semantics, which is what most people use these days, is yeah, you can figure most of it out. Um, the operating system does pretty well with it. Um, it still has to do context switches, but they're um, lighter because you don't have to switch address spaces, which is great. Um, but you still do have that context switch cost. You still do have a stack per thread that you're going to have to be messing with and you still have now you have the problem of locking between threads so it sounds great to say well if i want to communicate data with another thread i just give it the address of the data but of course if we both try to write on that data at the same time we have the usual data race problems and blah blah and rust tries to statically protect you from doing that by accident but it doesn't of course solve the problem that now instead of paying the cost of a context switch and some copies i'm still paying the cost of a mutex of being of locking the data typically so that none of the other threads can write on it while or read from it while i'm working on it um so not so great maybe there's a better plan and another plan that's been floating around for 30 or 40 years and almost as long as threads or maybe longer i don't know is to do what's called task pools and in the task pool idea we don't have a thread per control flow of control we have a small number of threads typically one per core or two per core um, and those things pull small tasks out of a, a pool of small tasks so short running tasks and um, so we have we can have a very large number of tasks outstanding and the um worker thread will pull a task out of the chunk out of the set of tasks that are ready to run and um and uh when it's got that it will go ahead and run it until one of two things happens it will run it until it finishes in which case the computation has produced a value and that value is put wherever that value needs to go or you, it runs until it's going to block and in this system the idea is that we never have tasks have workers blocked waiting for anything so when a task is about to block we um put it aside and um arrange for it to actually be put back in the ready queue when it's not going to block anymore. Now that last bit is easier said than done. How does that work? Well, select, epoll, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a bunch of operating system mechanisms to help with this, but yeah, it gets very complicated. But the good news is we minimize the context switch costs because typically the worker threads don't switch context very often because they're just picking little tasks out and running them. Um, there's still a stack per thread, but we don't really care about that cache usage or whatever because it's not, there aren't that many threads. Um, and a lot of times the synchronization can be done by having a separate task that does the synchronization rather than using locks, which turns out to be sometimes more efficient. So that's the sort of task pool plan and it seems like a fantastic plan um, so how do we implement this well there's an old idea floating around which goes by sort of many related names and concepts are here uh, I'm gonna call it what Russ calls it the idea is a future a future is sort of a closure that will continue running a computation when you call it so the idea here is that I can sort of use this functional programming idea that a function represents some computation. And when you pass me a, uh, when I call a function, it might, instead of returning a value, return a function that will later produce a value. And that's sort of the essential idea here, promises or futures or whatever we're calling them this week. And uh, 
like I say, these go under a bunch of names, delay force, promises, generators, continuations. All these things are different in subtle ways. I don't want to go into it here, but the basic idea is the same. Um, and so the idea here is, well, how are we going to implement this task pool? Well, we'll have it be a pool of futures that are in some state of being run or ready to run or partially run and ready to run or whatever. And that's what the workers will pull out of. And one of the recent things that happened in the last year or so is that the Rust's idea of, the, of a future was nailed down enough <laughs> that we ended up with uh, future in standard. And that's standard future future. And it's sort of a future plusy thing. The whole async await mechanism was sort of inspired by JavaScript and other things, and it's very callbacky, and this sort of captures that callbackiness in a trait. And so here's the future trait for what it's worth. The important things to really pay attention to are the output type, which is what type of value the future is actually going to return when it completes. And then there's this poll method, which pins itself. Don't worry about the pin. It's not important at this level of understanding. And the co and takes a context, whatever that is, don't worry about it. It has to do with how it's going to get woken back up if it blocks. And then what it returns, though, is a poll struct, uh, a poll enum. And the poll enum is one of two things. It's either poll pending, meaning... I'm blocked now. I don't have anything I can do. I've run as far as I can. So whenever you call poll, it runs the future forward until it either is about to block, in which case it will re instead return poll pending, or it finishes and produces a value, in which case it will return poll ready with that value. Now, if it blocks, if it returns poll pending, then that context here is used to um, set things up so that when the thing could unblock when the pending when the whatever cause was going to cause the thing to block is now no longer going to cause the thing to block the future will be stuck back on the in the task pool and be ready for uh execution again and so now with this mechanism, the threads never block. Ideally, they just run along doing their computation. Anytime they're about to block, they set the thing aside. When things are ready to unblock, they put themselves back in the task pool or get put back in the task pool. And we just keep running like that. So that's our processing model. And that's been around in Rust for a few years. Uh, it hasn't been part of standard. The future trait hasn't been part of standard until recently, but there is a futures crate that has been around for a long time, which has contained various implementations of this idea of a future. And it's also contained some mechanism for building uh, task pools. And that is now moving into standard and one of the things if you look at that machinery that you realize really super fast is that the machinery is really kind of awkward to use uh, in particular now functions that um that um you know want to return a future actually have to have type impl future output equals t where the T here is probably some fancy type that has results and all kinds of stuff in it. And so it gets really tedious. Before impl trade, it was really annoying. But once impl trade was put in a year or two ago, then, you know, it still is tedious to type these types in and get everything set up right. And so now that's great. You can say that a function or a block is async. But it does more than just return the right type. It also builds a little state machine internally that sort of takes care of all the blocking and stuff that could happen and makes sure that poll returns the right thing. And before that was done with a macro in the old futures crates and 
run times and stuff that was done with macros now it's built into the syntax of the language and that's the async keyword in the language um the other thing that was added at the same time async was added to the language is the dot await which is the syntax was controversial it is what it is the dot await uh operator on futures which causes a future to run to completion it will do whatever it needs to do blocking the future until the future actually gets a value back and then it will return the value and so it's a way of sort of unwrapping the future forcing it to produce its result and so with this machinery with the async and dot await machinery um we can start to wire together futures uh, to get our work done in the form of a task pool. So what machinery do we need to bring along? Well, we need a few things. We need implementations of potentially blocking primitives that are async, right? I can't read or write or send or receive on a TCP stream or lock a lock or whatever, all these operations potentially could block you. And we don't want them to block, so we need async implementations of them all so that um, the worker can switch tasks when they're about to block. And the other thing we need is the actual task pool itself. We need implementation that has the machinery for spawning, supplying worker threads, wiring all the stuff together so that the thing can actually execute. And there's sort of two standard ecosystems. There's the uh, Tokyo ecosystem and the async standard ecosystem. And the, those ecosystems both provide both of these kinds of things. Uh, that's not entirely fair. A lot of this stuff is provided by third-party crates. They're not technically part of either ecosystem. One of the reasons that future was put instead is because ideally normal async await programming is agnostic as to which executor it's running under. It doesn't really care, uh, you know, as long as everybody implements future properly, uh, it doesn't really matter whether you use the crate with Tokyo or async standard or whatever. And in class today in the lecture, we'll actually talk about an example of that. So, um, yeah, so you use your own, you can also build your own machinery for, you know, executors and stuff. And that's certainly a thing. Um, the two ecosystems Tokyo that are standard, the ones that people use the most is the older Tokyo ecosystem. It's one that has been around for a very long time and is sort of associated with Firefox as part of its implementation. And Tokyo or Tokyo, I don't even know how you say it, is um, a sort of very mature compared to other options ecosystem. The, the problem with that is that it's also got a lot of backward compatibility adventures. There's Tokyo and the old Futures Crate in about three different versions and so you can look at older documentation and get pretty confused there's code that's older code and things get a little hairy sometimes um the newer fancier alternative which comes with minor community drama like rust things seem to do these days is the async standard ecosystem which i find to be a simpler cleaner interface it's certainly newer and um is sort of an attempt to sort of take the stuff that's in stud that needs to be asynced and async it together with a fairly easy to use executor. Uh, I'm going to be concentrating on async standard today. I should say that up at the top of these notes are links to the sort of introductory book for um, Tokyo. Um, this says, you know, it's just, it, these are both, you know, generic ish async await primers, but this one is definitely built around Tokyo and um and uh you'll notice that there's a lot of to do's in this uh in this documentation there's a lot still to be filled in and that's a little nervous making after so many years the uh async standard one 
is mostly done. There is a to do here for collected small patterns, but it at least has one collected small pattern in it. I I this is the this is so depending on which one you want to do, you probably want to grab one of these two books, or arguably you want to grab both and work through them. There's a lot of stuff in the async uh, in the Tokyo one that is lower level and gives you a lot more idea what's going on. They actually have you implement an executor in here, which is a really good way to understand what the executor does and how it works to some degree. Um, and I worked through this one first and don't regret it, even though I ultimately decided that for what we're doing, that probably the async standard one's a better fit for us. So yeah, I mean, it's all pretty immature. The docs aren't done. Things are still changing pretty rapidly, really. There's always new surprises. Um, there's a lot of functionality that's missing. Uh, you know, I was preparing to show a demo around the Telnet crate and async, but the Telnet crate doesn't support async yet, for example. And there's, a, you know, basically a lot of the system, ecosystem needs to have async versions still if this is all going to make sense and what you end up with is what this famous essay about the colored function problem talks about which is um which is this idea that the problem is that if i have a library that provides some really nice functionality but it doesn't provide async support then i'm kind of out of luck there's no very good way to call that library from an async program and while i certainly can call non-async library or async libraries from the non-async program that's awkward too it's not a good situation so i thought we'd today just look at a really really simple example of all this i've talked for quite a long time about things without actually showing you much um, let's actually take a look at a program so if you look um, here in PDX CS Rust is the URL for a program that's a little server and the service this server is going to provide is a simple counter it's going to be a network service and you connect to its port and it gives you a unique count. It's a 64-bit count, so you aren't likely to run out anytime soon. And so this is about as simple as network services get. And let's start by looking at a synchronous version of this. Uh, the threaded version. So we're not going to do a process version because the but here's sort of what this looks like as a very bog standard parallel network process thing now we can have an argument about the right way to do this i chose to do it the fancy way with a mutex and some locking mostly just to give some illustration of how the mutex and locking would work this could be a much simpler service if i move the counter up out of the thread and incremented it there and that way we wouldn't have to do any locking because there would only be one thing providing stuff but let's just assume for the moment that this counter increment is a proxy for a fancier operation that really wants to be done in parallel and in that situation we need to lock the counter we need to do its thing we need to write the new count out and the trick here is going to be that um why do we want to parallelize this at all why is this seems dumb why don't i just write the thing and be on well because this write could block i'm actually going to need to get the whole thing out to something that's potentially across the network and if it's across the network then this write could block for a long time and i don't want to be sitting there blocked waiting for somebody to take my write while um while i'm have other requests coming in because they'll pile up real fast so what i'm going to do is spawn a thread per incoming request and this is pretty standard right this is pretty standard uh network parallelism which is something we've seen before and so the problem with this of course is that 
you know, this is a counter. It's very lightweight, but it's potential that I'd like to be able to handle, you know, hundreds of thousands of these, which means that, you know, in requests per second, what's going to dominate the cost of my handling a request? Well, a couple of things. One is the actual spawn. So I have to spawn a new thread, which is not a super cheap operation for every new request that comes in. I also, uh, and then, you know, the, those threads may overlap. If I have a lot of threads that I'm spawning very fast, I may have a lot of these write operations going at once and that can be expensive in that the operating system really doesn't like to manage hundreds of thousands of threads anyway at the same time. It'll do it. It's not perfect. And so let's, let's demo this. Let's actually, um, build this you'll notice whoops oh right it's going to build all the sync machinery because it's hard to get multiple binaries to do the right thing this is a limitation of cargo so you know we can run this and show that it works and stuff and then we can uh actually look at what it would be like once we've done that to actually um so on 10123, oh, here's a counter at zero. Oh, here's a counter at zero. And you can see each time that I um, ask for a counter, I get an incremented response. And if I had a whole bunch of things uh, doing this, everybody would get a unique counter value. The most expensive part of this and arguably is writing this out, but hey, um, we can turn that off if we were worried about performance. Now, let's look at the um, async version of this and see what we had to do to sort of widget it around. The first thing is, instead of using a bunch of stuff from std, we're going to use a bunch of stuff from async std instead. And this is the beauty of async std, is that it sort of provides a lot of the things of async versions of the things that we would otherwise be using from standard IO. It turns out that because reasons, we actually had to split out, or it was convenient to split out the um, various functions into separate async functions. Now notice the async fun here. There again, that means that this thing doesn't really return unit. It returns a uh, future whose output type is unit. And um, and so when I say async in front of here, I get a state machine. How does that state machine work? Well, notice the dot await here. It says if the counter's locked, and notice that we're using the async standard mutex, if this counter's locked, it's going to then, you know, when you try to run this future, it's going to return a poll uh, the poll's going to return um, pending because the lock's locked. And when the mutex finally gets unlocked again, then maybe this thing will be put back on the ready queue and can run. Um, this tends to be a much more efficient operation than a uh, thread mutex. Uh, we do our counter thing, and then we are going to again wait down here until the write's done, and we won't return until then. So if this write is about to block, then we will not block, but instead we'll uh, return. The poll will, poll will return pending, and we'll stick a select descriptor in somewhere, or epoll or something, so that when, uh, when the write is ready to complete, then this will be put back on the ready queue and we'll return. So, and notice I'm just being gross and using unwraps everywhere here because I'm not being careful. The, this thing all, stuff all works fine with the normal result stuff, except that, of course, things have to be synchronous. They have to be send sync because the reply may be, you know, the state machine may be run on a different thread each time it pins. Um, you know, each time it wakes up, and so you have to deal with that. Here's the listen function. 
which basically, again, it's an async function. Again, it awaits. What does it await this time? Well, you'll notice this part's a little different. It awaits for someone to send it a request, and that means that you know it never blocks. Um, it waits for the socket to get set up. And then it waits for somebody to want to talk to the socket. And when they do, then it wakes up and the and we make sure it's not an error. We get the address, we show the address, and now we do task spawn. So this is kind of interesting. Here, I literally am saying, no, 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 no. I don't want to wait for this to happen because that I don't want it to be synchronous. I want it to be asynchronous. And so this is where the executor that async standard provides actually starts a new worker task without blocking the current one, right? This thing sort of puts a new task on the queue that does the reply, right? It's weird because notice that we're calling reply here. This isn't like some weird thing, but reply returns a future, remember? So whatever future reply returns, um, that's what's going to get stuck on the ready queue for a worker to pick up and then this loop will continue um having put a thing on the ready queue this loop will continue back to where it blocks here um the main is pretty much the same we make our counter we block on that you'll notice that we i'm not sure why that is a clone I'm a little confused. All right, so that shouldn't need to be clone, and I'm not sure why it is. And um, now we're just going to, this is the executor again, the async standard executor. We're saying, no, 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 just wait until this thing is done, right? Well, when will this thing be done? It'll be done when we return from listen. Um, which means when there's n when the socket closes on the other end. Um, that won't normally happen, so normally there will be no return. But if it were to do so, then there we'd be getting back out of this. So let's rebuild that. And then let's um, CSA sync. And hey, presto, we've got a counter. And let's do the, the Telnet game again. Hey, look, we get a zero counter, we get a one counter, we get a two counter. And if we build a fancy example, we could pile up a lot of threads, sending a lot of requests for counters at this, and it would be fine. So is this more efficient? Is this something where we've got a tremendous improvement over what we were doing with uh, with uh, threads, I don't know, right? There's an argument to be made that it does, but it's really the only real way to know is to measure. And comparing these kinds of things is really hard, especially for a task as lightweight as this. It's hard to know what efficiency looks like. It would be, you know, you almost need a professional grade network traffic generator and a remote connection and you need to somehow spam a million requests a second for counter updates uh, onto this thing and then you can measure the performance of both solutions and see what happens that's a big job and i'm not going to do it but anyway that gives you some feel hopefully for what async await is about it's at this stage, something that I would not use unless you're absolutely confident that you need it. The thread-based solutions are typically just easier to build. And if it's clear that you can get decent performance, usable performance from the thread-based solutions, I think that's far and away the way to go. If, on the other hand, performance is absolutely critical for you, uh, then this is something to consider to potentially get you better performance. Uh, all the web frameworks, for example, right now are going to async await with the idea that the number of web requests per second they can handle will go up. And that seems to be somewhat borne out. Um, that's async await. Uh, like I say, the, the code we just looked at is available. And uh, thank you very much for listening.